Hello and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. I am Cy Kelly, your host, as promised, Jimmy Aiken with us this hour. Jimmy, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers and the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, one of the most popular uh, documentary podcasts in the world, uh, as far at least as far as I know. And you can talk to him uh, now. You can ask him whatever you like. It's open forum. It's Friday afternoon, so we're feeling uh, loose and ready. So if you've got a question, uh, give us a call, 888-318-7884, 888-318-7884. Jimmy Aiken, thank you for helping us out on this Friday afternoon. Cy Kellett, thank you very much for being here to host for us. Otherwise, and, we would uh, be hostless. Yes, which is a, a, it's a terrible affliction, but it's not as bad as being, being guestless. You could do this without me, but I can't do it without you. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, what dropped this morning on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World? Well, it's a patron's questions episode. So we it we released um, an episode focusing on questions that were asked by our patrons, including what mysterious experiences have Dom and I had, because last episode was mysterious experiences the listeners had had. So now the patrons who were listeners turned around and asked us what's weird that's happened to us in our in the past. Also, why did God make dinosaurs and bunches of other interesting questions? Ah, all right. The God made dinosaurs question. Very good. Uh, and and uh, each Friday, a new episode drops more than 300 episodes now. So you, it's all there. You got all, if you haven't been listening to Jimmy Yankee's Mysterious World, all of that in front of you uh, now. 888-318-7884, the number. Ezekiel is in Arizona watching on YouTube. Ezekiel, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy Aiken. Hello. Um, my question is about the deuterocanonical books mm -hmm. and specifically, um, like not only how to defend them, but also are they divine scriptures like Tobit and Judith, if they're like more parable? Well, they are divine scriptures, and Tobit and Judith are ex essentially ex extended parables. But it's obvious that uh, that parables can be part of scripture because Jesus uses parables in the Gospels, and the Gospels are part of scripture. So if you have parables in the Gospels, then you could have extended parables as well. There's no set limit on how long a parable can be. And so you can have a parable that's the length of an entire book, like Tobit or like Judith, as long as you make it clear to the reader that that's what you're doing. And both Tobit and Judith have very clear signals to the reader to communicate the fact that what you're reading is a parable. In fact, in Judith, that's obvious right from the very beginning of the book. Okay? Yes. Now, in terms okay. of the other part of your question, uh, how to defend them, well, it depends on what you're defending them against. Um, sometimes people who reject the Deuterocanonicals have a particular objection to something in the Deuterocanonicals, and then you need to respond on that basic thing. If what you're responding to, though, is the more general objection that they don't belong in the Bible, well, uh, the apostles used the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. They use it like the apostles and the New Testament authors uh, use the Septuagint version. It's the version of the Old Testament that's quoted 90% of the time in the New Testament. And they didn't issue any warnings like, hey, even though we're using the Septuagint, forget about these certain other books. They don't belong. And so Christians naturally accepted all of the books that were in the Septuagint. They were received and read in churches and so forth. And that included the Deuterocanonicals. And eventually, when the Church clarified the exact boundaries of the canon, which was first done in a non-infallible way in the late 300s, and then infallibly later on at the time of the Council of Trent in the 1500s, they included those books. So even though there had been a minority of authors who rejected the Deuterocanonicals before it was in the Catholic Church, before it was infallible, that was always a minority position. And given that the apostles used the Deuterocanonicals and didn't, and even they even allude to things that are in the, uh, even though the New Testament authors used the Septuagint, and also included allusions to things in the Deuterocanonicals, it was entirely natural for 
uh, Christians, certainly the vast bulk of Christians, to accept them as genuinely scriptural, and the Holy Spirit guided the Church to recognize that. Ezekiel, I, I am going to leave that there, but if you would like a copy of uh, uh, Gary Machuda's book, Why Catholic uh, uh, Bibles, Bibles Are, are Bigger, bigger. Yeah, I'd be happy to send it to you. Uh, just hang on, and we'll uh, send it off to you. Off we go now to Taylor in Tulsa, Oklahoma, listening on 94.9 FM. Taylor, welcome. Go ahead with your question. Hey, okay. So I am a adult convert. I converted at age 30. My husband mm -hmm. is an atheist. I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible. We are constantly discussing um, the reasonableness of my Catholic faith. And mm -hmm. it all seems to come back down to him to the question of why does God allow suffering? So in my, um, when I try to explain this to him, it basically goes something like for we have to, for a loving relationship to exist, there has to be free will, and free will introduces the possibility of suffering. Um, but he seems to not accept this argument on the basis that because God can do absolutely anything, that God could create a world in which free will would not be necessary um, to have a loving relationship, if, if that makes sense. He basically will not accept that a God worth worshiping would allow any suffering in the world. And I'm just looking on for tips on how to discuss this with him. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to recommend is that you get a copy of a talk that I did. Um, now, I also gave this a, a, a version that was focused specifically on the question of suffering at last year's Catholic Answers Conference. I It's supposed to be released at some point publicly. It's supposed to be put on YouTube. I don't know if that's happened yet. But what I do know is I gave a slightly more generalized version of the talk a number of years ago, and that's available from Catholic Answers. Um, it's a DVD that's called The Problem of Evil, which includes not only the problem of suffering, but also the problem of moral evil or sin. Um, and so I'm going to recommend, because I can only spend a brief time discussing it with you right now, I'm going to recommend that you get a copy of that talk. You can get it by going to um, shop.catholic.com. And I'd love to send you a version of it, you know, complimentary. I don't know if we can do that since it's a DVD rather than a book. But if it is possible to do that, I'd like to do that. And maybe while I'm rattling on, Cy can check and see if that's possible. In yes. any event... Oh, yeah. Okay. In any event, um, I would I would agree that I, and I don't know that your husband has made this point, but I I see the problem of moral evil and the problem of physical evil or suffering as interconnected but distinct. And so I would say it would be possible for God to create a universe that has free will, but does not have suffering. Um, you know, suffering in humans, at least in this life, is caused by our pain receptor nerves, and he could create us without them, and he could still let us have free will. Um, I, uh, when it comes to his, your husband's claim that God could create a world that had love without free will, um, well, in a sense— that could happen. Um, it, in, in that case, people would basically be robots, and they would be programmed to act lovingly. They might even be programmed to feel happy all the time. But there's something missing, most people would say, from a love that is not freely chosen. If you're just a robot that's programmed to be loving and be happy, that love is less valuable in the, in the opinion of most people, than a love that is freely chosen, where you freely choose to will the good of another person, where you freely choose to love them. And it's that kind of love that God's actually interested in. It's freely chosen love. And that explains what's going on with the problem of moral evil. God allows moral evil because he needs to allow free will for that. When it comes to... Um, when it comes to physical evil or suffering, well, okay, uh, as I said, I think God could create a world that had free will, but yet 
did not have physical suffering in it because he could just delete all the pain receptors in our bodies. But you know what? Those pain receptors are doing a good thing by being there because by having physical sensations like pain, it prevents us from injuring ourselves. There are people who are born without a functional sense of pain. Uh, it's a condition called um, congenital insensitivity to pain, and it is a huge, enormous problem for the people who have it. They do tend, because they don't have any pain receptors to tell them when they're getting any functional pain receptors, to tell them when they're getting into a physically dangerous situation, they end up injuring themselves and it can shorten their lifespans dramatically. They can accidentally die because, for example, they don't realize it when they're sick. You know, the bodily pains that tell the rest of us that we're sick and getting sicker, they don't experience that. So they don't know they're sick. They don't end up getting treatment. They can put their hands on a hot stove and it can burn them. They can break their foot and not notice it and just hop hop up and start walking along and the damage gets worse and worse. They can have cuts on their, uh, it, on their skin that, you know, they can have flesh wounds that they don't even realize are there and they can get infected and die. So actually, most of the pain that we experience in this life is performing an important function. Now, there are cases where it doesn't perform an important function, where it's um, just hurting and it that pain is not something we can do anything about. Um, the And that, part of why God allows that is mystery. But it's not unfair of God to do that as long as we come out on the plus side. And one of the things that God has promised us, this is something St. Paul discusses on more than one occasion, is that the sufferings of this life are not worth comparing to the infinite weight of glory that God has for us in the next life in heaven. And so even if we suffer some in this life, it's a finite amount, and it will be more than made up for to us in the next life, which is infinite. And so consequently, we don't really have grounds to complain here or dictate to God what he must do, because as long as he's being fair with us, as long as he's going to make up to us for any purposeless suffering that we experience, he's still giving us a gift that infinitely outweighs the minor sufferings we've had in this life. And so um, so we, he, he's giving us infinite happiness in the next in exchange for a finite, for tolerating a finite amount of suffering in this life. And if you ask me, which would you rather have? no existence, which is, I assume, what he's proposing if he, as an atheist, or would you rather have a life of infinite happiness preceded by a minor amount of suffering? I'd rather have the infinite life of happiness. So that's kind of a brief sketch of some of the principles I would bring to bear in this. Another thing that I should mention that the Catholic faith teaches is that God wouldn't allow any evil including suffering, if he wasn't going to bring an equal or greater good out of it. And that makes it understandable why God would, uh, or it makes it understandable for us why God would tolerate suffering, because we do that ourselves. Um, you know, we have that saying, no pain, no gain, you know, applied to exercise, you need to get your muscles to the point that you're having um, micro tears in them and then they grow back stronger so that you gain muscle mass. Well, you don't get there unless you get the, your muscles to their exhaustion point where they're starting to tear. Similarly with little kids, you know, if we have a child, we know the child is in danger of various diseases that can be avoided if we get him vaccinated. But the process of getting vaccinated is itself traumatic for a small child who doesn't have an adult's perspective on what's happening. And so the child goes through pain, emotional and physical, when they're being vaccinated. But we as parents can allow that to happen because we know it's better for the child in the long run. A greater good, namely immunity to all these diseases, is going to come out of the child getting his childhood vaccinations. And so if we can do that as parents, then God as our heavenly father can do that with us. We may not see the good 
it at, at, that's going to come out of a particular suffering we have, just like a small child cannot see the good that's going to come out of the vaccination. He's not able to understand it yet. And in the same way, we're not yet able to understand the goods that God will bring out of our sufferings. But since we see that good parents here on earth will even do this, we can trust that our good Father who is in heaven will also have reasons for allowing particular evils so that greater goods can come out of them. And that's a snapshot of the principles I bring to bear here. Uh, Taylor, we're still not sure about that DVD, but if you would give Edgar an, an address where we can send the problem of evil DVD, we will ask Bernadette, uh, who knows everything, uh, at least everything about what we've got and what we can send. Uh, if, if we can, we'll send it to you. Let me put it that way. If we can, we'll send it to you. So just hang on and Edgar will get your information. We'll take a quick break. Be right back with more Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Oh, the computer froze. So we're still here. All right. Well, I can go to another call if you want me to, uh, Darren, or I can wait. We, okay, we'll, we'll do another call then. Well, that's good. I'm glad we have, we'll get another call in. We'll hang on on the break and we'll go to Mary in Kansas watching on YouTube. Mary, we're awful happy you're here. Uh, go ahead with your question for Jimmy. I, I just have a question about birth control. Many years ago, my husband had a vasectomy. Mm -hmm. And we didn't realize how serious it was not to do that at the time. But later, we both regretted it. We went mm -hmm. to confession. We were both absolved. But mm -hmm. the priest didn't say anything about being celibate mm -hmm. after that. Should we have? We well, just as a terminological matter, you're not celibate because you're married. What celibate means is unmarried. Uh, you're thinking of continence. Um, and... Okay. and the priest didn't say anything about y'all needing to be continent because y'all don't need to be continent. Um, if you have couples, if you have a marriage between a man and a woman and one of them is naturally infertile, well, they can go ahead and have marital relations because fertility is not the only purpose of sex. Um, in this case, your husband made himself infertile and that was wrong, but that doesn't mean he can never again exercise the uh, the marital act because re fertility is not its only purpose. It's for the good of the spouses too. And so um, it's just like a situation where someone has uh, is just infertile for maybe congenital reasons, they were born that way, or they didn't develop properly, or whatever, or they've been injured in some way. In fact, you can even imagine situations where someone was taking a risk, you know, they were doing something risky, and they ended up making themselves infertile unintentionally. But that doesn't mean they 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 can't continue to have marital relations. They're just infertile now. And yeah, maybe it was wrong for them to take the risk that led to them being infertile. But once they've repented of that, you know, they're just a normal infertile person at that point. Then the same thing is true even if they deliberately made themselves infertile. Uh, once they're once they've repented of that, the problem's taken care of, and they're just a normal infertile person now, and they can continue to have marital relations just like any other infertile person. Okay, okay Mary. Seems, it seems kind of like a loophole, though. So. Well, it's not because you got to repent, okay. and that means <laughs> saying, "I I made a mistake. I I I wish I hadn't done that. That was wrong. I if I ha could do that over, I wouldn't do it." You may even feel some temptations, like I kind of be tempted to do it over again. But as long as you've said, no, I realize now this is against God's will, and I would trust in His grace to find the strength not to do this, then uh, then you've made a break with the past. And and so consequently, you're in the same position as a, any other person who's infertile. Okay. Thank you very much. No Mary, problem. thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the call Bye. and the question. By the way, uh, I'd also your... I'd also point out yeah. vasectomies are not yeah. new. Um, we've had ways of making men and women permanently infertile for all the time the church has been around, and the church has never oh, really? taught. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't I mean, know it's that even, the ancient people could. Oh, yeah. It's even there in Deuteronomy 23, uh, where it talks about a man who's been wounded in the stones. 
And oh. well, if you're wounded oh. in the stones, that's going to make you infertile. And yeah. so we've had uh, we've had ways of making people infertile for all this time, and the church has never said don't have marital relations after this. Uh, Mary, I'm so glad that you called and we and uh, were able to talk with Jimmy about that. Uh, it's open forum. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. Jordan is in New York. Jordan, are you there with us? Do oh, we have Jordan? Hello? hello. Hello, Jordan. How old are you? Uh, 12. Hello. Well, we're very happy you're here. Go ahead with your question for Mr. Aiken. Um, I was wondering if a priest blessed a cloud, if it would rain holy water. I would say, yeah, um, that's that's a reasonable inference. Uh, blessings apply to whatever they're applied to, and if you apply it to a cloud, then the um, the small particles of water that are in the cloud will be blessed, and when they clump together and start falling down, they would retain that blessing. So if a priest were to bless a cloud, yeah, I'd say it would rain holy water. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. Thank you very much for the call. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, Jordan, if there's an adult there that can give us an address, I'd like to send you a book that we have. It's a, a graphic novel called The Truth is Out There. I think you'll enjoy it. If you'd like it, uh, just give um, the phone to... Uh, oh, go ahead, Jordan. You had a follow-up? I was, I was wondering if I could have your book, Teacher Strange Things. Sai, you Jordan, got a young fan. You're my favorite person ever, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, you can have anything you want. Uh, I'll tell you what, if uh, I assume there's someone there that can uh, give an address out, and I would be happy to send you my book, Teacher of Strange Things, and we'll send you The Truth is Out There if you'd like that as well. And Jordan, thank you for making my week. You made my week, Jordan. Uh, uh, Edgar, if you'll take care of that, thank you. We'll go to uh, Joe in Northern Kentucky watching on YouTube. Joe, go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Yeah, this is sort of a hypothetical question. Um, uh, good to talk to you guys. I know that you're familiar with the prophecy of the elimination of conscience. Um, I think that was, was that Garbandal, I guess? Uh, I think that was part of that prophecy. But it, It's been discussed in various that, places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I guess my question is, you know, we're supposed to see ourselves right as God sees us. And, um, you know, let's say we've, you know, gone to confession, you know, regularly and that kind of thing. I mean, will that stuff be kind of taken off the, and, and I know this is hypothetical, will, will that mm -hmm. be taken off sort of the plate, if you will? You mean so we don't, if, if we have a big worldwide illumination of conscience where everyone gets to see the state of their soul, Will right. they will they be seeing sins that have already been dealt with? That is that the question? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. Um, I would say that this is a matter of speculation. Uh, if there is such an event, then how it works and exactly what we see would be up to God. And if the purpose of it is to show us our present spiritual state, then I wouldn't see any reason to show us prior sins that have been dealt with. We'd need to see what do we have on our soul right now. Um, on the other hand, he might choose to show us things we've done in the past as a warning not to do them again, and we might see them without experiencing pain over them since, you know, they've already been dealt with. So, but fundamentally, I'd have to say it's up to God what he chooses to do. I also should uh, mention that this proposed event is not that well grounded in sources that have actually been approved by the church. Um, I did an episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on this a while back. It's episode 122. And in it, I go through purported sources that people have cited in favor of this. And when you look at what is the church actually approved that contains this, yeah, there ain't a lot there. So I would suggest checking out uh, Mysterious Jimmy Higgins Mysterious World episode 122. You can get to it by going to mysterious.fm slash 122 and, uh, and check it out. Um, I also have to say that some of the people who've been talking about this are notoriously unreliable, and you might want to check out the following episode, episode 123, where I deal with a promoter of this idea, a name, a Canadian. Uh, priest and and mystic named Father Michel Rodrigue, who 
is completely not credible. Um, but he's one of the people that's been promoting this and claiming he sees it in his visions, which have been denounced by both of his bishops. So, and you'll, in listening to the episode, you'll see why he's wrong, because some of his, on on so many things he says, uh, in fact, his own l- telling of his life story is simply not credible. It appears he's making stuff up. But that's uh, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, episode 123, and you can get to that one by going to mysterious.fm slash 123. Joe, thank you very much for the question. Uh, we're coming up on a break now, and I think we're definitely going to take this break. I don't think the computer is going to freeze on this one. So we will uh, step away for a minute. If you haven't dialed yet and you'd like to ask Jimmy a question, it's open forum 888-318-7884. When it comes to Catholic teachings about Mary, there's one question we hear more than any other. Where is that in the Bible? The answer? Everywhere. In Bible Mary, the mother of Jesus and the Word of God, Father John Weiss opens Scripture to reveal a Mary who has been hiding in plain sight. Order your copy of Bible Mary today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. As we read the Gospels, every Christian faces the question again and again, what does Jesus mean? Getting the answer right is critical to both growth in holiness and fruitful evangelization. Want to know Jesus better so you can introduce him to your friends? Then it's time to get serious about understanding his words. Why not join Catholic Answers for our 10th annual Apologetics Conference? Learn from me the parables, sermons, and conversations of Jesus Christ. September 26th through 29th, right here in sunny San Diego. Learn from our guests, Dr. Scott Hahn and Kimberly Hahn, Dr. Ray Garendi, Father Sebastian Walsh, Billy Junker, Father Paul Check, and of course, all of your favorite Catholic Answers apologists. It'll be four days of fun, faith, fellowship, and a live radio show. Seats are still available, but going fast, visit catholicanswersconference.com or call 1-888-291-8000 today. Why We're Catholic is the one book you can hand to anyone to invite them into or back to the Catholic faith. With more than 400,000 copies sold, Trent Horn's book has had a number one ranking on Amazon.com for five years running. Now available in softcover, bulk cases, ebook, and on Audible. Find out what the excitement is all about. Order your copies of Why We're Catholic at shop.catholic.com or visit whywearecatholic.com. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett, your host. It's a very nice Friday because Jimmy's here with us for a little bonus open forum. I think this has happened to us a couple weeks in a row, and it's always nice when it happens to have Jimmy here. I do tend to make the mistake of asking Jimmy what's dropping tomorrow because I'm used to working with him on Thursdays. And it didn't, it's not dropping tomorrow, it dropped today. And uh, Jimmy, if you want to just describe, if you, if you don't mind, would you let yeah, us know what's uh, dropping? Patrons Questions episode, and it deals with a whole bunch of different subjects, but um, among them are what mysterious experience, what are the mysterious experiences that I've had and that my co-host Tom Bettinelli has had, and why did God create dinosaurs, and what science fiction books to read, and all kinds of things. Oh, you can do what kind of science fiction books to read? Oh, yeah, it's Patrons good. Questions. I, I, don't, I don't restrict the topics they can ask about. Uh, did Dom give any suggestions on? Is he a science fiction reader too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is yeah? Oh, all right. Uh, Joe's in Northern. Is that right? I mean, uh, no, we just did Joe. I apologize. Uh, let's go to Megan in South Carolina, uh, listening on Catholic.com, our website. Megan, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Um. Hi. So, um, I'm. I'm. Um, I've been Catholic since I was young, but I've never really gotten the, like, clarification on this. What's mm-hmm. the difference between the Apocrypha and the Deuterocanonical books, and, like, how can you defend those? 
Okay. So we actually dealt with how to defend them earlier in the show. And uh, I would suggest, you know, replaying the episode after we're over for a briefing on that. Um, so I don't just repeat everything I said earlier this hour. Um, also, Cy, let's see if we can send Megan a copy of my book, The Bible is a Catholic Book, which goes sure. into the history of the entire Bible and, you know, covers this issue. In terms of uh, what the difference between the Deuterocanonicals and the Apocrypha is? Well, the Greek Old Testament, which is known as the Septuagint, contains a certain number of books that are not found in the current, notice I said current, in the current Jewish and current Protestant Old Testaments. And those additional books in Protestant circles came to be referred to after the Reformation as the Apocrypha. Apocrypha is Greek for the hidden ones. The problem with that name is these books were never hidden. They were in standard editions of the Old Testament, and of the Christian Old Testament, and always had been. And so they were never hidden. This is a misleading term that was applied to them after the time of the Protestant Reformation. Well, many, though not actually all, of those books were included in the Catholic canon of Scripture. And because they're different than they're, you know, a different set of books than the ones that are more universally agreed upon by um, by modern Jews and by Protestants and and so forth, a special term needed to be come up with for them so that we could refer to them as a group even though they were just ordinary books of the bible for you know christians throughout history now you know since there was disagreement about them we needed to come up with a special term for them and the term that was invented was deuterocanonical deuteros is greek for second and so these are part of the canon, they're canonical, but they're kind of in a second place in the canon because not everybody agrees about them Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, no problem. Wonderful, Megan. Megan, hang on, and we'll send you the Bible as a Catholic book, Jimmy's uh, book, uh, and uh, we'd love you to have it. And we can go to Carlos in Miami, listening also on our website, catholic.com. Carlos, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Um, where? So was the, was the Nicene Creed the only document of the Council of Nicaea, and... If, and also, were there, where can I find the documents of the other councils? Okay. I didn't hear the, the first I question. Did. I did. did. you hear it? Did yeah. You, okay. His first question was, was the Nicene Creed the only document of the Council of Nicaea? And properly speaking, the Nicene Creed, as we say it in church, was not exclusively a document of the first Council of Nicaea because the ending of it was different. Um, so what we're actually saying today in church is the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed because... <clears throat> Most of it was written by the Council of Nicaea, but the part at the end, beginning with where it deals with the Holy Spirit, that was written at the First Council of Constantinople. The the original version of it, the one that was come up with by the Council of Nicaea, is called the Creed of Nicaea. As but when we say the Nicene Creed, we really mean the one that had that was produced by the two councils. In any event, uh, the Creed of Nicaea was not the only document that the Council of Nicaea produced. We know that in addition to that, they also produced a list of 20 canons. These were uh, rules. A canon means rule. And so these canons were rules about how to do things in church. And they cover a variety of different things. But uh, they're, they're not doctrinally oriented so much as practically oriented. They're kind of an early version of canon law. Um, and we have those 20 canons. Nicaea also may have produced other documents, but we don't have any of those. What we have is the Creed of Nicaea and the 20 canons that it produced. Um, in terms of where to get the documents of ecumenical councils, they're obviously the, uh, the most recent council, Vatican II, 
is extensive enough that it fills, you know, a whole book by itself. And all you have to do is Google, you know, documents of the Second Vatican Council and a variety of editions will appear. When it comes to the councils that preceded uh, Vatican II, their documents are short enough that they actually can fit in a two-volume set. And there was a two-volume set of them produced a few years ago. It was edited by... Um, I want to say Gerald Tanner, um, but it's you, you can you can look that up too. There are also books that contain documents of the Council of Trent. You can you know look up canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. The there's a famous set of early church writings that is available for free online. It's commonly called the 38 volume set because that's how many volumes were in it. There were 38 of them. And one of the volumes deals with the history of the first seven ecumenical councils plus a few others. And that one, that volume on the seven ecumenical councils contains the texts of those councils, as well as some councils that were not ecumenical. So there are a variety of different sources that you could consult, and those are some pointers for where you might be able to find them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Megan. I hope that I, I, uh, oh, excuse me, that was Carlos. I Carlos, pardon. I don't know what's up you're with me all of a sudden. Living in here. the past, dude. I know. I can't get. I can't get <laughs> caught up to the current times. Chris in Ohio is next. Uh, Chris, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's anything immoral about eating higher intelligent animals like dolphins. I know people eat dolphins. Or um, hunting them as well. Uh huh. Well, they are animals, and so the church's understanding is animals do not have rights, and animals can be used for the good of man, including the good of having food. So it's not, there, it's not like this is intrinsically immoral. Having said that, if you don't feel comfortable eating a, a more intelligent animal, well, then you don't have to. You know, personally, I don't eat octopus. Um, I, I used to. You know, I'd go to Japanese restaurants and they'd have Taki, which is Japanese for octopus. Then I'd be happy eating the octopus. But then I started learning about octopi or octopuses to use the technically proper English plural. It is octopuses. Um, and uh, I just got uncomfortable. Those things are freaky smart. And I got uncomfortable eating something that was that intelligent. And that's not because they have rights or it's intrinsically immoral to eat them. It just made me squeamish. And so, um, so you know, I don't eat Taki anymore. And I wouldn't eat Dolphin either because they're also really smart. But, um, but there's nothing intrinsically immoral about doing so. Okay. Okay, thank that's you. you were looking yeah, thank you very much. All right, Chris, uh, thank you very much for the call. Uh, Jimmy, you're just marching through them, so off we go to West Virginia. Mike's in West Virginia. Go ahead, Mike, with your question. Uh, yeah, uh, how are you doing this evening? Um, so uh, I've, I've recently come to to learn that if you only have venial sins on your soul, that you can bless yourself with holy water, say an act of contrition, and ask God for forgiveness. Is Is that true? Yeah, those are some of the things you can do to deal with venial sin. You don't have to do those things. Just saying I'm sorry is enough. Okay. Um, you know, or the, you know, the non-sacramental absolution at mass, you know, where we'd say the confidior, the I confess to you my brothers and sisters, you know that prayer. Um yeah. there's there's a there's a non-sacramental absolution at the end of that that the priest says, that'll do it too. Basically, just turning your will away from venial sins is sufficient to blot them out. And how you express that turning of the will away from them, you know, can vary. It can be a prayer. It can be use, use of a sacramental like holy water. It could be any number of things. Okay. So, so I, you know, I understand that if you still wanted to go to confession, you can, but I guess yep. my follow-up question to that is, so is confession really only necessary for mortal sin? Yes, confession is really only necessary for mortal sin. Okay. Well, okay, that's I learned something new recently. I did not know that. 
Yeah. Now, you're welcome to go to confession and confess venial sins if you want, um, you know, because if that'll help you grow closer to God or help you, if confessing them will help you avoid venial sins better in the future, or if it'll help you feel God's forgiveness better, you're welcome to do that. It's just not necessary unless it's mortal sin. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it. All right, Mike. Yep. Thank you, Mike. We'll take a quick break. Right back with more Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. There's only one Catholic Answers Live. The Catechism defines evangelization as the proclamation of Christ and his gospel by word and the testimony of life. But what does that look like in real life? It looks like St. Paul Street Evangelists out in the public square sharing the good news. We're a Catholic nonprofit that starts conversations by handing out free sacramentals. Then we employ our method of listen, befriend, proclaim, and invite. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to learn more. Beyond Damascus with Dan Demite and Aaron Richards is our show for young adults. Everybody's talking about encounter. Everybody's talking about that mountaintop experience. What we fail to often talk about is what happens after, what happens beyond that Damascus moment. Jesus Christ is calling all of us to be missionary disciples, disciples of Jesus who are on mission to bring the kingdom of God here and now on this earth. Beyond Damascus with Dan Demite and Aaron Richards tomorrow at 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. We have had lots and lots of calls today, but the lines remain quite full. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. It's an, a Friday open forum uh, today. And off we go to Texas now. Jean-Pierre listening on the Guadalupe Radio Network in Texas. Jean-Pierre, welcome. Uh, go ahead with your question. Hello, guys. Uh, first time caller, and um, I have my 10-year-old boy here who is more excited than me. But anyway... Ah, my question well, say is, how do you do for yeah. me? <laughs> yeah, he's listening at you. So I'm a fertility care practitioner with the Creighton model system. Uh, mm -hmm. I heard, I think, four calls ago, a gentleman that had the vasectomy. I, mm -hmm. I give the advice to couples that have either the vasectomy or the tubal ligations, etc., to not have intimacy uh, during the fertile days. My question is, is this theologically advisable? Uh, I mean, good? Uh, what do you guys suggest? Well, the Church has not addressed this in a teaching, and so um, so this is a matter of theological opinion. And I know that there are some, uh, particularly in the natural family planning community, who give advice along those lines. I would be very hesitant to do that. Um, for a couple of reasons. The first one is I'm going, I'm telling someone to do something beyond what the church requires of them. And I'm very hesitant to tell people they need to do something um, that the church does not actually require. You know, I don't want to take on that responsibility. Um, another reason is that I would be concerned that it can foster scrupulosity. Um, and it can reinforce the problem. Um, the problem is that, or at least the problem that presents itself at the moment, um, because if you just let the couple say, okay, we dealt with this, we went to confession, now we're going to lead normal lives um, and not worry about it, then that lets them move past the situation. But if you tell them you need to keep track of when the woman is is fertile and practice natural family planning on those days, you need to abstain on those days, um, then what you're forcing them into is a situation where psychologically they keep having to remind themselves of this over and over and over again. And I, I know that some that I've heard in the NFP community have said, yeah, then they can do it as an act of penance. Okay, yeah, but if they've already dealt with it sacramentally, that's the kind of penance that God demands. If they want to do more penance than that, well, that's up to them, provided they run it past a spiritual director, 
because, um, you know, even if you set out to do a form of penance with good intentions, it can stop producing the good effects. And consequently, if people are doing substantial penances on a regular basis, they need to be in contact with a spiritual director who knows them and can monitor their situation. And if if the penances they're doing be, start being counterproductive, the spiritual director can tell them to back off. But that's not going to happen if you just tell them you need to do this and do it every month and let them go out into the wild and they're not in contact with a spiritual director who can monitor whether this penance is being productive or not. What it can do instead, and this is one of the ways, just one, that it can become counterproductive, is by them having to constantly think about what they did in the past with the vasectomy, or the tubal ligation, if it was a tubal ligation, is <clears throat> they're going to have to revisit that issue every month. And they may be tempted to think, well, maybe maybe it would have been okay for me to do that. Maybe, maybe, and they may even get resentful. It's like, oh man, I gotta, we gotta abstain now for several days. And, and it's just going to keep raising the issue and giving them an occasion every month and even more than one occasion because they'll be thinking about it between the different fertility times. Um, they'll, uh, they'll be thinking about it and they may get resentful and they may get tempted to re endorse the situation that the sin that they had committed in the past. And I think it's better to, as St. Paul says, forgetting what's past, press on to the good. And so um, I don't, I don't, I don't recommend advising people to have a monthly reminder of a sin that they committed in the past that has already been dealt with sacramentally and that um, that they may be tempted to reaffirm. I think it's better to forget it and let them move on. And um, so for all of those reasons, I would not advise people to do this. If I would tell people honestly, well, if this is something you want to do, that's okay. But make sure you do it in conjunction with a spiritual director who knows about this situation so that if he senses this is becoming counterproductive, he can tell you to back off. I like it. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, it's, uh, so I'm an engineer as a professor. So for me, it's just, okay, I'm going to give you a solution. So <laughs> when I, mm -hmm. when, when I knew about, um, uh, that couples realizing when they're fertile or not, that's what it came to my mind to give this, this advice, but I like the, uh, the spiritual direction, uh, com a companion as, as, as part of it. Yeah, got it. Thank you very much. No problem. Well, John, uh, thank you very much for the call, and I uh, hope that your son uh, enjoyed it. Well, um, well, uh, hello to him. Yeah, if you howdy, like a copy son. Of Jimmy's howdy, son. Howdy, John Pierre, son. Uh, if you'd like a copy of Jimmy's uh, book, A Daily Defense, I'd love to send it to you, and thank you for the great work that you're doing. Um, just hang on. If, if you'd like that, Edgar will get a, an address to send it to you. I think we're uh, going to William in Vermont, listening to EWTN on Channel 130, Sirius XM Satellite Radio. William, go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for taking my call. So <clears throat> my understanding from um, the doctrine of the Church in St. Paul that uh, one should not um, seek to receive the Eucharist if they're not, you know, um, if their soul is not is not prepared and and uh, mortal sin has not been uh, absolved, um, mm -hmm. if someone is divorced, if someone gets divorced, mm -hmm. um, however, they were never married in the church. They were divorced. They were divorced from a civil marriage. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that a civil marriage is, uh, or uh, the, 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 they can't receive an annulment because because they were not married in the church. And therefore, what is, what is the procedure for being um, able to receive communion again? Okay, so okay. I need to ask a question here. Um, you say that someone had a civil marriage and then got divorced. Um, was this person or the person they married a Catholic at the time of the marriage? Yes. 
Okay. So in that case, the, uh, the, unless there are really weird circumstances in that case, since, and I assume they also didn't get a, didn't get permission for this marriage. They didn't, didn't go to the Bishop and get permission for it. Is that also correct? They were, they were, they were. So when they were married, they were, um, lapsed Catholics and they, mar- and they, and they married civilly. Right. And, and yet they, 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 they came back to the church they did not receive an official blessing for the marriage. However, they divorced, and you know, while they were back in the church, they were going to confession regularly. Okay, but, Sir, Sir William, I I got the answer I needed. They did not approach sure. the bishop to get permission. Correct. Correct. Okay, so since they were Catholics at the time of the marriage, even though they were lapsed, and they had a civil marriage, and they didn't get permission for it, unless some really weird circumstances apply, um, that marriage would have been blocked from coming into existence. So it would be a null marriage. And it, it would be very easy if if these parties or one of these parties wanted an annulment, a declaration of nullity, be very easy to get one. The church has a special process for that. It, it's called the documentary process, because in a case like this, the the verdict is so clear, all you have to do is produce a few documents to show it. So it would be possible to get an annulment. Um, and this type of annulment is very easy and quick. Um, and I would ad- advise you to get one if you want to remarry. Having said that, um, if you if these people have, now that they've divorced, the marriage was null, so they're not having marital relations with each other anymore. And as long as they're not having marital relations with anybody they're not married to, you know, then uh, then they're not committing new mortal sins, and uh, not objectively speaking. And so they can go to communion right now. Uh, you know, they need to have gone to confession for any previous mortal sins they did commit, but they would be able to go to confession right now without any special procedure. You don't need an annulment to go to confession as long as you're being continent. And I'm going to leave that there and try to get at least one more question on. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, let's go to Hector in Amar- Amarillo, Texas, listening on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Hector, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Thank you very much for taking my call. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Um, I, my question kind of pertains to the first. The okay, call that he H- just hung Hector, up with. Hector, Hector, just so you know, we have a very short amount of time. Please state the question in the form of a question. Perfect. Can you explain Catholic Catechism 1650 more into detail? My fiance uh, and I. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, well, Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1650, is quite lengthy, and I don't really have time to read it and walk us through what it means sentence by sentence. Is there a particular difficulty you're having with what this says that I could clarify for you? The very last part, um, my fiancé and I have been both uh, divorced civilly, but mm-hmm. our marriages have not been annulled. Okay. We do live like brothers and sisters. She's got her own uh-huh. house a hundred miles away from mine. Uh-huh. Um, if we do marry civilly and live like brothers and sisters and keep the living arrangement that we have now, can mm-hmm. we receive the sacraments until our marriage is annulled and we can get married through the church? Yes, because as long as you're not engaging in marital relations while you're not married, you can you are not committing new mortal sins. And as long as you're not committing new mortal sins, you can go ahead and receive communion. You do need to go to confession for any prior mortal sins you've committed, um, but you can you can continue receiving communion. You do have to be careful about making sure that this is living as brother and sister. And even beyond the marital act itself, there are some things that brothers and sisters don't do with each other. Um, exactly. Yeah, but as long as you're genuinely living as brother and sister, um, you're not committing a you're not committing new mortal sins. Um, now, you asked, did I recall correctly? You said, can you get civilly married and and live together yeah. as brother and sister? 
I wouldn't yeah. advise it, but properly speaking, it's not a mortal sin in and of itself. At least that's what many canonists and moralists would say. Uh, Hector, thanks very much. Uh, we had to rush you just a little bit there, but I appreciate that you were able to get the question out. Sorry to those we didn't get to, but, you know, we do this uh, almost every day of the week, so we'll yeah. look forward to you calling back again. Jimmy Aiken uh, one, has been one out. One thing I would add for Hector is if okay. the Nomans don't come through, you are you may have some difficult choices to face, so I would recommend not proceeding further down that path towards marriage until you know you can marry. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. And thank you again, Hector. And that will do it for us. We'll see you next time, God willing, right here on Catholic Answers Live.